medical oncologists who receive numerous queries from patients on diet restrictions, as well as what they should eat while they are on treatment. Today's webinar will hopefully answer some of these questions and is open to patients of all cancer types. For today's webinar, we are very honored to have with us Dr. Verena Tan, Assistant Professor of Dietetics and Nutrition with Singapore Institute of Technology. She's an experienced dietitian with more than 15 years of diverse and well-rounded experience spanning clinical nutrition, academia, research, as well as corporate work. We also have on our panel, Dr. Amit Jain, who is a consultant medical oncologist at NCCS. At the end of this session, we will have a short poll on whether you found this session useful and what other topics you would like us to cover in future webinars, so please do fill that in. Without further ado, we will now let Dr. Verena share her expertise with us on eating right for cancer. Dr. Verena, please. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, first and foremost, I'd like to thank uh, NCCS as well as the LEAP team for inviting me to work together with them to deliver this talk. So thank you, Dr. Stephanie, for the introduction. And Dr. Amit later will help uh, address some of the questions for Q&A later. So without much further ado, let's get started. So thank you everyone for taking time off uh, your lunch break this afternoon to sit by in front of a computer to listen to us share some information. So what I intend to cover today is a very short uh, nutrition talk on how to eat right for cancer. So what I'll be covering today, firstly, sharing about whether sugar feeds cancer. Is it a myth? or is it a fact? And then let's cover some content on nutrient-dense immune-boosting foods. What are some of these foods that we could incorporate into our diet to improve and boost our immune system right now? And thirdly, nutritious food ideas for your pantry. Once we cover this content, we'll go into the Q&A session to address some of the questions that you all have sent, sent in through during the registration. So just a short, short disclaimer to say that um, every individual's cancer journey is very different. And some of you out there are going undergoing different cancer treatments compared to some others. And you would be experiencing different side effects. So for this talk in general, it is for um, people in general with uh, whether you have cancer, whether you are looking at prevention of future cancer or you are undergoing treatment. So if you are unsure about the appropriateness of any particular food that I'm sharing during this talk, please speak to your, your doctor or you can ask your doctor for a referral to a dietitian to then help manage your diet and types of food that you're allowed to have. All right. So let's start. This is a question that I think has been circulating a lot in, 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 on the internet. Does sugar feed cancer? Different people have different opinions. So for myself as a dietitian, I like to look at the scientific evidence behind such a statement. So what are some of the questions that people would ask or say? Sugar feeds cancer cells, make, making them grow more aggressively. So yes, sugar feeds cancer. Is that the truth? Now, another statement that there, that, that's uh, ongoing is that removing sugar from our diet can starve or stop cancer growth. Is it true? What about how does the sugar we consume through food and drink affect our health and what can be done about this? So just let me go through what are some of the facts about sugar and cancer before we decide whether this statement is a myth or a fact. So a fact about sugar and cancer. Some basic um, uh, information is that all kinds of cells, including cancer cells, depend on sugar, or we call it glucose, for energy our body cannot dictate or does not dictate which cells uh, it sends energy to and which cells it doesn't. So all the cells will need glucose for energy. And the fact is that giving more sugar does not make cancer cells grow faster. It makes all cells, 
in your body grow, but it does not specifically make your cancer cells grow faster. And there is no clear evidence that sugar in your diet, again, just specifically feed tumor cells and don't feed other cells in the body. Remembering the fact that your brain cells rely heavily on glucose for energy, for you to function, for you to think, to talk, to speak. Now, completely, uh, completely avoiding all sugar can, on the other hand, create a lot of anxiety and stress because people would then need to start, oh, I cannot have this, I, cannot, I must look at the label, uh, this food cannot contain any sugar. And having anxiety and stress can also have an effect on your immune system by suppressing your immune system and suppressing the ability to defend against any pathogens or any uh, viruses and bacteria. Now, then you might ask, if I said that sugar doesn't cause cancer or if the science says sugar doesn't cause cancer, why do we need to worry about it? Now, firstly, there is still an indirect link between sugar and cancer. Now, studies have shown that added, added sugar promotes weight gain. And what do I mean by added sugar? I have shown a very nice picture of a forbidden drink that we are not allowed to get access to right now during our circuit breaker. Just one glass of bubble milk tea contains between eight to 19 teaspoons of sugar. It varies whether you are going for the plain bubble milk tea with 100% sugar or bubble milk tea with extra toppings. So fans of bubble tea would know what I mean. So sugary drink consumption has been linked to an increased risk of cancer. So being overweight and obese as a result of having such uh, uh, excessive added sugar intake it increases your risk of at least 13 types of cancer. So for example, they have shown that it increases the risk of breast and colorectal cancer. And for patients with cancer, getting adequate nutrition is important for helping their bodies cope with treatment. Now, I'm not trying to demonize all carbohydrates, but it's a fact that not all carbohydrates are equal. So there is this concept of glycemic index that I'd like to share with everyone. So when, we, when I talk about GI, it, it stands for glycemic index. So glycemic index is a classification of foods based on its blood glucose raising properties. So for low GI foods, they do not raise your blood glucose sugar as high, your blood sugar level as high as high GI foods. So what are some of the low GI foods that we have in our local diet? So low GI foods are, for example, pasta, cooked al dente, which means that there needs to still be a bite and chewiness to your pasta after cooking. Rolled oats, oat bread, muesli, pearl barley, multi-grain breads, as well as uh, our mung bean noodles or mung, uh, mung bean vermicelli, tanghun. For vegetables, these are the low GI vegetables, the broccoli, mushrooms, peas, and corns. And for fruits, apple, peaches, pear, oranges, kiwi, grapefruits, and berries. Uh, mostly the citrus temperate fruits. Dairy foods are considered low glycemic index. Beans and nuts, so legumes, soybeans, green beans, baked beans, and all nuts are low GI foods. And just to note that GI is a property of carbohydrate-containing foods. So it ranks carbohydrate, carbohydrate foods in terms of its blood glucose-raising ability. It does not include the protein foods or foods that are high in fats. What about the medium GI food that you should include um, in moderate amounts? Sorry, I have a typo error, it's glycemic index. So brown rice, basmati rice are medium GI, which means they raise your blood glucose level a bit higher than the low GI foods. Wholemeal bread, quick cooking oats, couscous, bihun, 
we get a bit more temperate with the fruits, the pineapples, the lychees, the papayas, and raisins and fruit juice are considered medium GI foods. Now, the high GI foods are foods that increases your blood glucose much higher than the low GI foods, and these foods are foods that you should limit. Starchy staples, our favorite Thai jasmine rice, our glutinous rice. I know um, dumpling festival is coming, so just be aware. I'm not saying no, but just be aware. White bread, uh, bagel, puff rice, instant oats, the yellow meat, mashed potatoes. Watermelon and dried date are considered high GI. The starchy vegetables, tapioca, sweet potato, as well as some of the, the processed snacks, the wafer, rice cakes, pretzel, and jelly beans. So this, let's come back to sugar and cancer. It's complicated, right? Sugar itself doesn't cause cancer. It has an indirect link, but it's not a direct uh, causation or association. At this moment, there is no way of specifically just starving your cancer cells of glucose without harming the other healthy cells in your body. There are some studies in animals which has showed that ketogenic diet, which is a high fat, very low carb diet, can help with tumor response. And as we speak, there are existing uh, clinical studies they are undergoing to show uh, whether such a diet can help in, in cancer therapy. However, we still need to know more about safety, the tolerance, the interaction with your current treatment, the side effects, as well as how it can then help with um, your cancer uh, progression, quality of life. So we still do not have enough study to show that such a diet will work. The next best thing that we can do that is proven is to simply cut down on added sugars, the fizzy drinks, the canned drinks, the sweetened beverages, as well as one of our Singaporeans' favorite drink. And finally, opt for good quality carbohydrates as well as try to limit high GI foods in your diet. So the next topic that I want to cover, it's about nutrient-dense immune-boosting foods that we should all include in our diet. What is eating healthily after cancer, you might ask? So my advice is be very careful, be very wary about claims that one type of food, a fruit or vegetable or, or whatever that has been claimed, having the power to cure cancer or eradicate cancer or prevent cancer entirely. Be very careful about that because the most uh, uh, proven way to fight cancer is having a balance, a varied and a nutrient-dense diet along with an active lifestyle. Now, some of you may not be very familiar with the, the term nutrient-dense, from a nutrition uh, perspective, they are foods that are very high in nutrients. So we call them nutrient-dense foods in contrast to uh, empty calorie food. We are still in the midst of a circuit breaker amid is our last week of uh, staying at home. So not only we know that having good personal hygiene, we need to frequently wash our hands, is important in fighting this pandemic. We also need to strengthen our immune system to build our a stronger defense against all other pathogens that might be lurking in our environment. What are some of the nutrient-dense food? So I, I've broken them up into three different pillars. The first pillar are healthy fats. So foods that contain healthy fats include cold water fishes like salmon, sardine, mackerel, nuts, for example, almonds, cashew, pistachio, Brazil nuts, and macadamia nuts. The second pillar are the good grains and seeds. So we have the whole grains like the oats, mm -hmm. barley, brown rice, and couscous. Seeds like chia seeds and flax seeds as well as fermented food, which we'll, we'll touch in detail in the later bit, 
And finally, the wholesome vitamins and minerals. So fruits, for example, the berries, the kiwis and the guava, as well as uh, vegetables like capsicum, broccoli, spinach mm -hmm. and kale. So we should include more healthy fats into our diet. Like I mentioned earlier, uh, try to include oily fishes like salmon, mackerel, sardines and caught into your diet simply because they are low in saturated fat and high in omega-3 fatty acids, which offer many health benefits. Uh, a good recommendation or a goal that you should be looking for is having about two fish meals a week in order to meet your omega-3 fatty acids requirement. If you don't take fish or you're a vegetarian, you can also find good fats in avocado, nuts, Greek yogurt, olive oil, and even eggs. Next, we move on. For whole grains, many people only think about oats. A lot of people have forgotten about barley, which is a very common uh, grain in our Asian diet. So I'm sure most of you, if not all, would have grown up with your mom, your grandmother, brewing, boiling barley water. Myself included, I drink that the barley water, I throw away the grains, which is a big waste. So please, from now onwards, include, eat the barley grains that, the, the, that your mom or your grandma or somebody has bought for you. Why? Barley itself is high in dietary fiber. It helps to lower blood cholesterol. And again, it is a low GI food as what we have covered earlier. The barley that we get here in our local supermarkets are called pearl barley. If you go to NTUC, if you look at the packet of barley grains, turn to the back, it says pearl barley. And these are barley grains that have been hulled and the external brand layer has been removed to make eating and cooking easier. One cup of dried pearl barley can easily give you four cups of cooked barley. So it behaves very similarly to rice. And this can be eaten as a side dish like rice. You can replace your jasmine rice with barley because it is a carbohydrate staple. It's a whole grain carbohydrate. Or you could use them in salads as part of your carbohydrate intake. So barley, no matter how you cook it, will still be slightly chewy. The consistency, the texture will be something of a brown rice. Don't expect uh, barley to turn mushy after cooking like, like white rice. And that's the reason why it is a low GI food as compared to jasmine rice. Now for fermented foods, I just wanted to highlight that um, for fermented food, which is a, a trend in the nutrition world right now, uh, please take note that for patients who are on immunosuppressive therapy, for example, chemotherapy, uh, chemotherapy, these foods may not be suitable. If you are not sure, please, please double check with your doctors uh, before uh, consuming such foods. Now, for people with a, a normal immune system, it has been increasingly shown that fermented foods can boost your immune system by working through your gut. So the probiotics that are present in the fermented food stimulates the immune system in your gut. And this means that it helps your gut act as a, or form a protective barrier between the harmful pathogens and the body. So some of the fermented foods that are commonly found in our Asian diet could be yogurt, kefir, sauerkraut, uh, sauerkraut is German, tempeh, natto, Japanese, kombucha, miso, Japan, kimchi, Korean. So these fermented foods, if you have a healthy immune system looking to boost your immune system further and your doctor gives you the go ahead, please feel free to include such good foods into your diet. Lean protein. So the next step would be for people who are undergoing, whether you're undergoing uh, chemotherapy, you're looking at uh, or, or cancer treatments, or you're recovering from, from any cancer treatment, we should go for lean protein, for example, 
chicken, turkey, fish, lean meat, low fat dairy. However, please do limit your intake of red meat and processed meats to not more than 500 grams per week. And not only is the, in, the amount matters, but the quality of cooking also matters. So certain uh, cooking method, for example, uh, grilling, frying, and deep frying has been shown to increase the risk of cancer. So healthier cooking method that you can use to cook your protein and your meat can be steaming, gentle stir frying, boiling, or poaching. All right, so such a uh, gentle heat also retains the nutrients within the food. So, and, and then you benefit from all the goodness that is still retained in the food by eating it. Now berries, berries, it's, it's something that almost everyone knows that they are healthy, they are nutritious. So any fruit that end with the word berries or berries in general are wonderful nutrient dense foods. So berries are not only low in calories, they are rich in antioxidants and the anthocyanin pigment, which is the color that gives the fruit uh, its color, the pigment that gives the fruit the color, uh, offer health promoting benefits. So anthocyanins have also been shown in studies to block cell proliferation and inhibits tumor formation. So for those who are not very sure what are fruits that are high in anthocyanins. If you look at the, the slide in front of you, the blue, the red, the purple fruits are the ones that contain anthocyanin pigments. So don't need to remember the chemical, the scientific term. Look at the colors, blue, red, purple. Now something that I'm not sure if everyone knows about, but I myself am um, when I was, I was was writing up this talk, it's that we ignore capsicum range. Red capsicum contains twice as much vitamin C as your citrus fruits, and one just one medium red capsicum provides at least one point five times the, your daily vitamin C requirement. Then you might ask, so should I not buy the green, the yellow, and the orange ones? No. They are still capsicum. They still have lots of nutrients present, except that the green, the yellow, and orange are at different stages of ripeness. The green are considered the unripe capsicum. The reds are the fully ripened ones. And the yellow and orange are in between the two. So personally, I like to use all colors in my cooking. I have two young children. What better way to entice them to eat vegetables than to make it very colorful? So I buy the green, the red, and, and the, the orange and mix them up in the simple stir fry. I'm also sharing with you some um, recipes that incorporate all the goodness of nutrient dense food into uh, a single recipe that you can prepare it at home. So I have this barley delicious uh, capsicums. If you are interested in, in the recipe, you could contact either myself or the lead team, and we are happy to send you a PDF copy of this in, uh, of this recipe. So incorporating capsicum with rich vitamin C together with low GI barley, you really have a, a nutrient packed uh, dish by and, and they will provide you with all the immune boosting benefits. Another recipe I like to share is this nutty stir fry pork. Um, this recipe uses broccoli, which we know have cancer fighting ability, protein rich lean pork, as well as the nutty crunch of cashews, which contains all the, the good fats within it. So prepared into one dish, it makes a, a, a highly nutritious meal into a single dish. Next up, sesame ginger salmon. Uh, again, I'm not a fan of raw fish. I don't like sashimi, but I do love uh, this recipe in the sense that it gives a bit of sweetness and the ginger not only takes away the fishiness and for those who may be uh, having a bit of the side effect of your cancer treatment, uh, for example, nausea, I think this dish will tie in very nicely and actually make your appetite uh, it may even stimulate the appetite. Uh, 
So sesame seeds is something that we use quite frequently in our Chinese cooking. It's a good uh, source of healthy fat. It's got proteins, it's got the B vitamins, lots of minerals like the zinc, the selenium in there, as well as antioxidants. So again, a lot of nutrients packed into a single dish to provide you with as much nutrition as possible in one mouthful. So I just wanted to end off this section by saying that a truly healthy immune system depends on a balanced mix of nutrients, vitamins and minerals over time. Having a normal sleep pattern as well as exercise is important to ensure that you build a healthy and strong immune system. You cannot expect to eat one orange or one capsicum and expect it to strengthen your immunity immediately. Such, um, you need to have a balanced mix of all the different types of food and you need to have them regularly over a period of time in order to strengthen your immune system. The last section that I want to go through, it's on what nutritious food ideas can you stock up your pantry with? I'm not sure whether you're affected during the, the panic buying at the beginning of the circuit breaker, but I was. And as a result of that, Straight Time actually have, have invited me to write up an article that you can check out on the link above, which will give you more details of, of this section on what can people stock up on that are still healthy and nutritious during this period of panic buying circuit breaker that we cannot go out to enjoy our food? First and foremost, frozen food. Frozen meat, frozen seafood, and frozen vegetables are a good way to stock up your protein and your vitamins and minerals, and yet without worrying about them perishing. Uh, but some of you may, may be concerned about the nutritional profile of frozen food versus fresh foods. From a nutrition perspective, buying frozen food, for example, vegetables, studies have found that in fact, frozen vegetables do contain higher levels of nutrients than fresh vegetables, right? Now, for some people who are not, do, are not used to buying frozen food, you can still buy fresh food, for example, your fresh chicken, your fresh meat, and then freeze them. Almost anything can be frozen, perhaps except eggs and canned foods. So try not to, to, to freeze uh, frozen, uh, eggs or, or canned foods. Talking about canned food, um, canned food is notorious for having very high sodium and high sugar content. But amidst all the different types of canned food, there are still the better canned food that you can choose from. So for example, tuna can in spring water is, is a, good, a good source of protein and canned sardines, uh, baked beans that has less sodium, canned chickpeas uh, for those who like or who are vegetarian or want to make their own uh, homemade hummus, Fruits can in juice, not in syrup, can also be a good option for those who, who wants to stock up on some fruit at home. Thirdly, we can also buy uh, and stock up on dried foods. So dried foods, because uh, they have water that has been taken out, so they are dehydrated, they have very long shelf life, and they are very easily used in your meals. So if, if you think about dried foods, or are you talking about the dried streams, the dried mushrooms, yes. And on top of that, rice is considered a dried food. Dried noodles, your spaghetti, your pasta, oats and beans are all considered dried foods that you can try and stock up on and can be easily incorporated into your meals when we are all stuck at home. Fourthly, we need some snacks in between meals to keep us going. So dried fruits, unsalted nuts and seeds are good snacks that you could also keep uh, in, in your pantry and to snack on in between meals when you're feeling a bit uh, peckish. Last but not least, we are all in this together to boost our morale, not only our immune system. We could also stock, stock up a bit on dark chocolate, 
some coffee and tea and this helps to make ourselves happier when we are all at home or listening to webinars at the same time. So in summary, I just want to conclude this short session by saying that firstly, sugar does not make cancer cells, sorry, that's a spelling error, grow faster. Okay. Number two, it's that having nutrient-dense immune-boosting foods together with sleep, regular sleep, adequate sleep, as well as exercise, all together complement and build up your health, build up a healthy immune system. Last but not least, during this time of circuit breaker, I know we are slowly easing out from our circuit breaker, but consider stocking up on healthier frozen, canned, and dried foods in your pantry. And with that, I really thank all of you for your kind attention. So like what uh, Dr. Stephanie has said, I, I'm currently with the Singapore Institute of Technology. However, I also do have my own consultancy, uh, nutrition consultancy. If you have any questions, you can also email me uh, at the email address below. If not, we can always, can always reach out to the doctors or anyone in NCCS if you require more diet information. With that, I thank you all for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Verena, for that informative session. And I'm sure our participants found that very helpful. For our next segment, we will be discussing some of the questions which were sent in. We received lots of questions and would like to thank you all for participating so actively. While we unfortunately will not be able to answer all the questions in view of time constraints, we have selected the most frequently asked questions for our panelists to discuss. The first topic we will discuss is a very common question that we get in clinic. What food should we avoid while undergoing chemotherapy? Can we get Dr. Amit to share your thoughts on this? everyone. Uh, thanks for that talk, Rina. Uh, that was really informative. I feel guilty about the me goring I had yesterday. Um, this common oh, question oh, that I'm going to address. <laughs> yes, all the bubble tea. <laughs> so uh, I'm just going to go straight into um, the, the first set of questions uh, that, that Stephanie's uh, asked us to, to try and answer. Um, and this is to do uh, with something we get asked very often in clinic. Um, I have a set of slides here. Uh, I thought I'd just try and summarize um, what we need to talk about in uh, three slides. So, and just get um, slides up. So let's go to the first slide. Cool. I'm just going to briefly talk about um, foods that we need to avoid during chemotherapy. And that also ties in with what do patients uh, you know, what, what should patients eat during chemotherapy? And while we're waiting for the slides to load, um, I'll just talk about uh, this uh, briefly. Um, first of all, I think prior to thinking about what we need to avoid during um, treatment, uh, patients uh, really need to think about whether what they're eating is nutritious and whether it is full of vitamins, minerals, um, and macro nutrients as well as micronutrients that are important to keep uh, people healthy. Patients who have been diagnosed with cancer are probably in a state where their body is um, poorly nourished and this is partly to do with the cancer. It can be due to a variety of other factors as well including um, dealing with symptoms from cancer. Uh, so it's particularly important to top up um, and eat well, so this is the first principle. Eat nutritious, varied food, as Rina has pointed out to us with so many tips today. A well-balanced diet. Some patients uh, tell us uh, that they cannot eat their full meals anymore. But while people generally eat the traditional three meals a day, 
um, anyone is, uh, is, is encouraged to eat more than three meals a day. They cannot eat a full meal each time. Make it up to five meals or six meals a day. Eat them in smaller portions. It's a very common problem to feel full earlier with less food um, when patients are dealing with cancer and cancer treatments. Um, when patients are on treatment, it's particularly important to try and avoid ending up having new problems, for example, food poisoning. And I think one of the things to talk about would be a range of foods that are particularly notorious for causing food poisoning. Um, so I'm just going to briefly touch on a few specific types of foods that you probably have to pay a little bit more attention on how you handle. Make sure you store and cook eggs, meats, fish, oysters, and other seafoods properly. Sometimes these contain bacteria, viruses, that can actually cause um, food poisoning. Rice, when left overnight, left in the fridge overnight, sometimes can pick up bacteria and leave toxins in the rice that would probably be able to cause food poisoning. So generally, if you want to avoid that, rice should be eaten freshly cooked. And this is especially important for patients who are on chemotherapy and have drugs that are suppressing their immune system. During pregnancy, women are told to avoid unpasteurized milk and cheeses. Um, it's a similar concept applying um, uh, that to patients who have cancer and who have uh, treatment on anti-cancer treatments, which suppress the immune system, um, bacteria from, uh, from um, unpasteurized sources can actually lead to problems. So avoid unpasteurized milk and cheeses. We think that uh, probiotics are good for health but not in states where the immune system is suppressed. So when patients are on chemotherapy, you probably should avoid yogurts, yakult, and any other probiotic that, uh, that, that might otherwise be touted as a health benefit in normal circumstances. Go on to the next slide. And I'm just gonna give you a few pointers on how you can think about your food especially in the context of people who prepare their food themselves. Shop well. Make sure you check your expiry dates. Avoid moldy, bruised, damaged, fresh produce. Pick your produce. Pick it um, if, if, it's, uh, if it looks good and you're going to eat it soon. Or go buy fresh produce when you're going to use it. Store it well. Rina's told us about how almost anything can be frozen. If you do want to freeze, do not refreeze, throw away bad food, and don't eat leftovers for tomorrow. Make sure your fridge works well, and that when you're freezing things down, it freezes fast. When you're preparing your food, make sure you wash your hands, clean your work surfaces, try and separate raw food preparation from ready to cook food and wash raw foods thoroughly where that's necessary and appropriate. I generally tell patients that if they want to have fruits, try and have them freshly peeled, freshly juiced. When cooking, if you're thawing your food, cook the thawed food immediately, cook thoroughly, eat it when it's, uh, try, and, try and cook it so that it's piping hot all the way through and don't reheat your food. And so these are some of the pointers that I think uh, might be helpful. Um, this is uh, a quick revision for myself as well to give some specifics to patients. Um, and I think when it comes to talking about individual foods, if there's a particular um, doubt that you might have, feel free to reach out to any of us or to your doctor if you want to clarify a specific food item and ask whether that may or may not be appropriate for you to eat during the time that you're on treatment, especially when you're on chemotherapy. Thank you, Dr. Amit, for sharing your views on that. I'm sure a lot of patients found that very helpful. The next topic we will now discuss is another very common um, question that is brought up. There are quite a few uh, patients who asked about special diets while undergoing treatment. Uh, maybe we'll uh, pose this question to Dr. Verena. What are your views on cancer patients following special diets, such as plant-based diets, keto diets, and is there a need to eliminate certain foods, such as meat or seafood, while they're undergoing treatment? 
Thanks, Stephanie. Yes, that, that's a very common uh, question that a lot of cancer patients uh, ask um, during their treatment, during the healing, the recovery process. Can I accelerate it by following a special diet? I mentioned earlier in my talk that, uh, for example, ketogenic diet has been in, in trend in the recent years simply because it helps in weight loss. Now, the original uh, use of the ketogenic diet is for patients with epilepsy. And a ketogenic diet, it's not a standard diet. It has to be followed with a lot of medical supervision because there are health consequences with having such a high fat, low carbohydrate intake because it switches on your body's uh, production of ketones in order to fuel your brain and, and your other parts of the body. So, so for me, such diets are, are not advisable until we have very clear uh, clinical evidence. So currently, there is no scientific evidence to show that a ketogenic diet is beneficial and at, in this current juncture, it might be more harmful than beneficial to go on such diet. Now, the other diets that, that are very commonly out there are, can I switch to a plant-based diet? I don't think there is anything wrong because vegetarians, vegans still get sufficient nutrition from protein, from vitamins and minerals from plant-based foods. Increasingly, we have a lot of products or even foods out there in the market that can provide you with, uh, with high quality protein. So for example, we are talking about uh, soy products and soy products, in fact, have a complete, it's, it's the only plant food that has a complete amino acid profile that can match that of animal products. Right. So having soy in your diet is considered like having a high quality protein in your diet. Legumes, beans are also good sources of protein, especially important in times where you are undergoing cancer treatment and you need the excess or the additional protein to help with uh, to prevent malnutrition and also to help prevent the loss of lean muscle mass. Coming to can should I avoid meat, seafood, poultry, etc. There's a lot of information out there on the internet on what is the perfect food, what is the magic bullet, what should I avoid. Uh, like I previously mentioned, if somebody or someone on the internet, the website says that by avoiding this, you can cure cancer, beware of such claims, possibly unsubstantiated and possibly not true. Now, the, the the, liter the, the scientific consensus is that red meat consumption, especially those of processed meat, should be limited because we, we, we know that they are associated with a higher risk of cancer. So depend And the cooking method of the meat itself also matters. Like I mentioned earlier, try to avoid deep frying, try to avoid uh, broiling. So go for cooking methods that uses a lower uh, temperature. Um, Studies have also shown that eating the other proteins from poultry, from fish, are in fact beneficial in preventing cancer. So there's a lot of information out there. So I suggest if anyone is not too sure, please check with your doctor, check with Dr. Ahmed, check with Dr. Stephanie or anyone in your medical team. And if they cannot provide you with an answer, they can always refer to a dietitian who can then help you plan a diet suitable for your own needs. Hope this answers. Thanks, Dr. Verena. I think that was a uh, very sound advice and I think our patients really appreciate uh, hearing that from a specialist. Um, the next topic that we will move on to again is a very um, hot topic. Um, a lot of our patients ask us about traditional Chinese medicine or TCM and other types of alternative medicines. Dr. Ahmed, would you like to share with us what your views are on this topic? So I'll generally, I'll share what I generally say in clinic when I'm faced with this question. Um, I give uh, um, the same answer every time. Um, the short of it is, we don't know. We don't know what the role of TCM is um, in cancer treatment. That's it. Um, there's lots of efforts internationally as well as locally 
to try and do some clinical trials to try and incorporate traditional Chinese medicine into cancer treatments so that we can better understand what the role can be from a more scientific point of view. My concerns with patients taking TCM are twofold. First of all, when patients take TCM, um, it is quite possible that some of the drugs inside the traditional Chinese medicine, herb concoctions, may actually interfere with cancer treatment. Um, so does that actually lend to cancer treatment becoming less effective because of those herbs being taken up? Um, the second concern I have is to do with side effects. Um, we do see many patients um, come in with side effects from cancer treatment, and this may be confounded and complicated when patients are taking other supplements such as TCM. If TCM medicines directly interfere with, for example, the metabolism of a particular drug, the, the side effects of a particular drug may be different. Um, and this is something that becomes a little bit uh, difficult to tease apart if patients take both TCM and anti-cancer treatment concurrently. So I generally advise my patients to avoid TCM when they are on anti-cancer treatment because firstly, I don't know if it's getting in the way of anti-cancer treatment working. Secondly, I don't know if it's complicating the side effects or for that matter, causing side effects. Thank you, Dr. Amit, for sharing that with us. On a related note, many people are also curious about whether it is advisable to take health supplements while they're undergoing treatment. Can we get both of you to comment on that? Uh, maybe starting with Dr. Verena. Thank you, Stephanie. Yes, another hot question that is commonly asked is, can I take supplements while, while I'm undergoing cancer treatment? So if you go to our current, our pharmacies, either one of them, you would see shelves and shelves of different supplements. It ranges from just the vitamin C tablets to really obscure ingredients that I don't know why it's even there on the shelf. So when it comes to taking supplements, I guess my advice is be very careful uh, and very judicious in what you aim to achieve. The safest form of supplement would be the multivitamins. Now, the, the rationale of taking multivitamins is that if you are undergoing cancer therapy, cancer treatment, and you have a lot of side effects, and that affects your appetite, that you do not consume adequate food, you don't have enough nutrition to help cope with, with your, your treatment, then that is the time where you could include multivitamins, whereby it provides this broad spectrum, uh, spectrum of vitamins, minerals, trace elements in, in that supplement to meet and fulfill any nutritional gaps that you have while you are not able to eat adequately to fulfill your increased nutritional needs. Other than that, um, single ingredient supplement are things that we should all try to avoid simply because the dosage is likely going to be very high. And for sure, we don't know what potential consequences there will be with interaction with the drugs or the treatment they're experiencing. So for again, I would also caution people who want to start on any supplement, do check with your doctors as well as your pharmacist, because they would then be able to advise on whether such supplements are even necessary for one. Number two, whether it will pose any danger to your current treatment. Amit, over to you. Okay, well, well, this is a fairly common question. And, and in general, um, I answer this in a slightly different way from the question about TCM. Um, and I ask uh, patients to think about whether the supplements that they're taking are found in day-to-day -day food items. So for example, if you pull out some supplements off the shelf in a pharmacy, you might look at the ingredients and realize that most of those items in there are foods that you eat on a day-to-day -day basis. The next question I follow that up with is, well, if you think that those supplements are nothing more than the foods that you can eat on a day-to-day -day basis, then can you just get enough of those nutrients from those foods? And if you can, then maybe you don't need the supplements. But if for whatever reason you feel strongly about taking those supplements, 
Um, as long as patients tell me that those supplements comprise food items that are usually part of diet, and that's quite distinct from, say, traditional Chinese medicine, where a lot of the herbs that are used are not part of our day-to-day -day diet, um, then I would say it's, it's not, it doesn't seem completely wrong if they feel strongly about it, but I try to encourage them to just eat nutritious food instead. Um, there are other supplements that are not part of our day-to-day -day diet, apart from TCM, that are sold on the market and are available um, to people. In general, there's very little science that has actually gone into discovering whether these products have the anti-cancer properties that they tout. Um, and the very nature of the nutrition industry, and we call that, maybe let's call it the nutraceutical industry, there isn't a strong onus on doing large-scale clinical trials before a product goes commercial because it's very expensive to do good science. So we'll never know the answer to some of the questions that people ask about supplements, whether supplements specifically have anti-cancer properties or whether they are harmful. But certainly where the nutraceutical industry is regulated, it's by the local regulatory authorities. As, as long as supplements are allowed to be sold in the country, they're generally deemed to be safe. In the context of anti-cancer treatment, if there's any doubt about how it gets in the way of anti-cancer treatment, I would say try not to. If it's a supplement that is made mostly of food that any of us eats on a day-to-day -day basis, then I won't feel strongly against that particular supplement. But at the same time, take supplements without burning a hole in your pocket. I think these are little practical tidbits that are picked up from patients along the way, and this is what makes sense. Okay? Two cents. Thank you both for that uh, very valuable advice. I think most of our patients would find that extremely practical day-to-day um, -day tips on what they should do in, um, with regards to supplements in the context of their treatment. I think we have time for uh, two more quick questions. Um, I will pose the first one to Dr. Verena. Um, can breast cancer patients take soy products? Okay, so another... Uh... Commonly asked question, can breast cancer patients take soy products? My answer is yes, why not? Um, I know, again, there's a lot of information on the internet. Accurate or not, I cannot comment right now. But a lot of uh, uh, information saying that, oh, soy contains a, a a chemical called isoflavone. It's a plant estrogen. And taking plant estrogen, it's going to increase or worsen your breast cancer because breast cancer is caused by excessive production of estrogen. So that is, again, a, a very far leap, unsubstantiated leap. Uh, so for, for soy products, yes, they contain a form of plant estrogen called isoflavone. But this only presents in plant. These are only present in plant. And many studies have shown that these plant uh, estrogen does not increase your risk or does not worsen uh, cancer in breast cancer patients. In fact, soy products are actually healthy. They are a complete protein. It has a, a, a full amino acid profile that, that matches that of animal products. So again, everything like what most dietitians, all dietitians would say in moderation. And, and the, if you think about it, people who routinely take soy products, they all live a long life. You're thinking about the people in Japan. So the soy products they take, the tofu, the soybeans, the bean curd, the, the miso products. So these are healthy plant-based foods that you can incorporate into your diet without worrying that it will aggravate or exacerbate uh, breast cancer. Hope this answers. Thank you, Verena, for helping us to debunk that myth. Um, the last question that we will take uh, will be, how does treatment affect my taste and smell and what can I do about it? Maybe we can get Dr. Ahmed to comment. Thank you for the question. Um, before I answer the question, I just want to uh, feel less guilty about my knee growing yesterday because it had lots of tofu in it. <laughs> so, so back to the question um, 
this is something that's uh, particularly challenging um, to give. I think um, everyone undergoing cancer treatment uh, with their own individualized treatment, specific uh, anti-cancer therapy may have uh, alterations that are very personal. In addition to that, cancer itself may cause problems with taste. And uh, this also would vary from cancer to cancer, as well as person to person. So in general, I would say, therefore, where we have treatment specific uh, related um, alterations of taste and smell, and it's very clear that this is treatment related, um, then do discuss this with your doctor. Uh, the medical oncologist uh, in his training um, has learned how to moderate the doses of drugs, to change drugs when necessary, especially if um, drugs are causing side effects that are getting in the way of day-to-day -day life and affecting quality of life. So have a personal conversation with your doctor if you feel that some of the drugs you're on are directly affecting your taste and smell. On the other hand, this may not directly be related to treatment. And if it seems to be related to other things, for example, if it's related to the cancer directly, or if it's indirectly related to treatment because it's a treatment-related side effect that's causing other problems. For example, uh, some patients on chemotherapy end up having fungal infections in their oral cavity, and this is something that's treated with antifungal agents, and we don't really need to think about trying to change the therapy drugs themselves. So we might be able to pick up specific medical problems that are contributing to this alteration in taste and smell, and all things said and done, if there's a certain limit to what we can do from a medical point of view, it's especially helpful to ask the dietitian to come on board. A dietitian can try and go through what you've been having and try and ask you about other things, including what your perception of taste is, what you want to taste, what tastes good for you. And as taste is a really personal thing and a matter of personal preference, a dietitian may be able to give you very tailored advice on how you can do this. Um, is that correct, Dr. Verena? Yes, thanks, Amit, for boosting my referral rate. <laughs> Just a joke. Uh, yes, so in our dietetics training to, to be a dietitian, we are also trained to help support cancer patients who are undergoing, whether it, uh, it's their treatment side effects, their uh, medication side effects, or, for example, side effects of chemotherapy, which tend to destroy their taste buds. So we have little tips and tricks out our sleeves on how to help people who, who do have, who experience the side effect and that affects their appetite and their food intake, which is then absolutely crucial to make sure that they eat enough and they eat enough of the nutritious foods to regain their energy, to build up the immune system, to build up their strength and back, back to where they are before before the cancer treatment started. So I'm just gonna give very, very quick uh, uh, tricks or, or tips. So for example, one very common uh, change to your taste could be that you have this bitter metallic taste in your mouth. It could be a consequence of the medications or, or one of the consequences of chemotherapy. So what I usually uh, tell my patients is that if you have a very bitter metallic taste, uh, you could try to, to suck on very cold and moist fruits. So pieces of, uh, for example, berries kept in the fridge, washed clean, obviously, or pieces of cut melons that lots of juice and lots of moist to really help with, with that bitter and metallic taste. Some patients also do have changes in, in, in so their, their preferences. So before treatment, they used to like sweet food. But after or during the treatment, they find that they cannot tolerate anything sweet. So what we get patients to do is actually keep a diary, a symptom diary. So write down what symptoms do you experience? What stage of uh, cancer treatment are you undergoing? When do the symptoms appear and what are some of the affected foods that cause that trigger? So with that symptom diary, we would then be able to sit down and identify, okay, you cannot take sweet foods. Let's look at some other alternatives that you can tolerate and we incorporate that into your, your diet. And if you're not eating well, we also have uh, strategies to help to enrich, fortify your food. 
to make every mouthful, every spoonful of food that you put into your mouth count as many calories, as much nutrients as possible. So you don't waste that mouth of food that you are struggling to put it in, inside your mouth to nourish your body. So yes, it's a, each patient is different. Uh, I cannot here give you all the advice because different people have different side effects and, and they are looking at different uh, 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 strategies to, to help. So yes, yeah, speak to your doctor for a referral if you need uh, support and help it with, with your diet. If, if you are struggling to even eat something and put something into your mouth because of the side effects. So yeah, speak to any one of us. We are here to help. Okay, with that, I would like to close the session. I would like to once again thank both our panelists, Dr. Verena and Dr. Amit, for their time today. I learned a lot from this session and I'm sure all our participants did as well. To our participants, if you have any questions after today's session, please feel free to discuss it with your doctors and your dietitians. We will now be having an online poll flashed on your screen. Please do take a minute to let us know if this webinar was useful to you, as well as um, if you'd be interested in another interactive Q&A session in the near future, and what other topics you would like us to cover in future webinars. If you have any other further comments or feedback, please kindly email us at leap at nccs.com.sg. Once again, I would like to thank everyone for participating in our first webinar, and I hope it has been useful. May we all stay safe and eat right during this COVID period. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.